In this lecture, we're going to talk about Lagrange multipliers. So first, let me give you the mean idea. If you want to optimize a scalar valued function f of x and y, subject to a constraint g of x of y equals c, and this constraint is a constraint we're putting on our domain, then what we're going to see is that we want to find where the gradient of f and the gradient of g are parallel vectors. In other words, the gradient of f equals lambda times the gradient of g, where lambda is just some scalar. If you're wondering why I picked the Greek letter lambda, it's tradition. So let's explore more of this idea of a constraint. So suppose we are walking on a mountain, which is perfectly shaped like the graph of z equals the square root of 16 minus x squared minus y squared. So that's actually an upper hemisphere. But I'm not just walking randomly on this mountain, nor am I going to the summit of this mountain. I am following a trail or a constraint described by the equation 5x plus 2y squared equals 20. So if I'm at some point on this mountain, it needs to be the case that my x coordinate times 5 plus 2 times my y coordinate squared equals 20. Given that I'm stuck on this trail, how high do I get? I'm not going to go up to the summit. Let's find my maximum height on the trail. OK, so here's Lagrange Mountain, and I've highlighted here the trail. So it turns out there is a summit to this mountain, but I'm not a very good hiker, and we're not going there. We are just going to follow this path. So this is a constraint we're putting on the x and y coordinates in the domain. You can see the domain down here is like the floor of this graph. 5 times my x coordinate plus 2 times my y coordinate squared needs to be 20. We are only considering points on the mountain that satisfy that property. So given that constraint that we're stuck on this trail, it seems like the highest elevation I reach is right around here. Let's take a quick glimpse at the theory behind Lagrange multipliers. So here I'm looking strictly in the domain. The horizontal axis here is the x-axis, and the vertical axis is the y-axis. This domain R2 is where I'm trying to sketch a topographic map of this mountain together with my trail. So you can see both superimposed on the same picture. What we're going to do is reinterpret this topographic map in terms of level sets of functions. The first function, f, is going to be the function for the mountain. So this is z equals f of x and y equals the square root of 16 minus x squared minus y squared. And then the second function I'll create so that the path that we're following is a level curve for that function. So let's let g of x and y be 5x plus 2y squared. The domain R2 is not just the domain for f, it's also the domain for g. Given these definitions of f and g, we can now say that these concentric circles are level curves for f. So all x, y values from the same circle get mapped to the same mountain elevation. And then my trail is the level curve g of x and y equals 20. We set it up that way because our trail was following the constraint that 5x plus 2y squared equal 20. So now I'm reinterpreting that constraint as the level curve for this new function g of x and y. We know that the gradient of a function is perpendicular to its level curves. Let's start first with the gradient of f. So if I pick any point on this topographic map, and compute the gradient of f at that point, it's going to be perpendicular to the level curve containing the point. So it's either going to point up the mountain or down the mountain. And in fact, I know it's going to point up the mountain because the gradient points in the direction of increase. Right? So the gradient of a function points you in the direction of greatest increase, which is going to be up towards the summit. So let me sketch some sample gradients of f. I don't care how long they are. I'm really just interested in the sense of direction. So there's one gradient of f. Here's another gradient of f. There's a gradient of f. All 
I sketched all five of these so that they were perpendicular to the level curve where I sketched them. The trail is a level curve for G, so the gradient of G will be perpendicular to the trail. It's either pointing up or down. It's actually pointing down. You can check that by looking at the first component of the gradient. It's going to be 5, so it always has to point in the direction of positive x. So there's a sample gradient of G. It has to be perpendicular to the trail. Here's another one. Okay, so that's how the gradient of G relates to the trail. Let me draw a couple more gradients for F. Now if we follow the trail, the highest point occurs right around here. And that's where our trail stops going up the elevation curves for F and starts going down. It's like that moment when a tennis ball turns around when you throw it straight up above you. And right at that moment, the trail is parallel to one of these concentric circles. Consequently, the two gradients are parallel. If you compare that to, say, over here or over here, you see that in general, the two gradients are not parallel. So this was just an illustration of the general principle, which is that if you want to optimize F, it's the height we reach on this mountain, subject to a constraint, my trail. You want to compute their gradients and figure out where they're parallel. In other words, one can be written as a multiple of the other. It doesn't have to be positive or negative. They could point in the same direction or opposite directions. They just need to be parallel. Okay, let's do one example. We are going to minimize the function f of x and y equals x cubed plus 2y squared, subject to the constraint that x squared plus y squared equals 1. In other words, I'm not looking to minimize this function in general. I'm only looking to minimize it over the unit circle. In general, the first step to these problems is, if necessary, to rewrite the constraint as the level set of some new function g. So let's let g of x and y equal x squared plus y squared. Then our constraint is that we need to live on the level set g equals 1. The second step is to compute the gradient of f and the gradient of g. The third step is to set up a system of equations that x and y would need to satisfy together with the multiple lambda in order to have the gradient of f equal to lambda times the gradient of g. Okay, if the gradient of f equals lambda times the gradient of g, then that means the first coordinate of f is lambda times the first coordinate of g. So for the x coordinates, I can say that 3x squared equals lambda times 2x. For their y coordinates, I can say 4y equals lambda times 2y. And that's it for the coordinates. But if you look at this, this is two equations for three unknowns. We don't know x, y, or lambda. So there's always a final equation that you amend to the system, and that is the equation given to you by the constraint. We need x squared plus y squared to be 1. So that's our system of equations. Now the system that results from this process can be easy to solve. It can be very hard or impossible to solve by hand. It really depends on the functions you're given. So systematically, here's what I do. I try to determine the conditions that would make each equation true. So the first equation would automatically be true if x equals 0. If x isn't equal to 0, then I can divide both sides by x, and I get 3x equals 2 lambda. The second equation is automatically true if y equals 0. If not, I can divide both sides by y, actually by 2y, and I get lambda equals 2. OK, now I just play choose your own adventure. So let's suppose x equals 0. If x equals 0, can I let y also be 0 for the second line? And the answer is no, because that would violate the constraint. So x equals 0 can only be paired with the possibility that lambda equals 2.
Okay, so if x equals 0 for the first equation, it must be the case that lambda equals 2 for the second equation. I don't have anything yet for y, but just go down to the constraint. If x equals 0, y is plus or minus 1. If we're looking to minimize this function, we would then check 0, 1, and 0, negative 1, and we would ignore the fact that lambda equals 2. We would have found the points. Lambda doesn't necessarily have to come into your calculations in the end. Okay, that's it for x equals 0. So if it's not the case that x equals 0 for the first equation, it must be the case that 3x equals 2 lambda. So if 3x equals 2 lambda, can y be 0? And the answer is sure, why not? If y equals 0, x is plus or minus 1. And we don't need anything to do with lambda. If it's not the case that y equals 0, then 3x equals 2 lambda and lambda equals 2. So this is the only calculation where I'm using something about lambda. If 3x equals 2 lambda and lambda is 2, then 3x equals 4, which means that x is 4 thirds, which is impossible because that can't satisfy the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. If x is 4 thirds, we can't plug it into that equation. Now I'm done with the system of equations. I considered the first possibility that x equals 0, found the possible points associated with that, 0 plus and minus 1. Considered the second possibility that 3x equals 2 lambda, and found all the points associated with that, which is plus minus 1, 0. So we have four points to test in this function. The maximum value we get will be the maximum of f subject to this constraint. The minimum value we get will be the minimum. Okay, so the final step is to plug the points that we've identified into the function. f of 0, 1 is 2, as is f of 0, negative 1. f of 1, 0 is 1. And lastly, f of negative 1, 0 is negative 1. So overall, the maximum value of f subject to this constraint is 2. And the minimum value is negative 1. Since we were asked to minimize, that's the value that we were interested in. Here's a picture of the situation. So I've plotted f in general, highlighted the constraint, and then plotted the constraint on f. So here you can see on the y-intercepts, f attains the maximum value of 2. And over at negative 1, 0, it attains its minimum value of negative 1, subject, of course, to this constraint that our x and y coordinates are coming from the unit circle. That concludes our discussion of Lagrange multipliers.